Good. Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because those, these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then Jesus told the parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none, cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. God's word for God's people. May our hearts hear and our lives respond. I've lived in the 21st century longer than any other century. I've lived with the internet longer than I've ever lived without it. One time in Bible school, after high school, we were asked to go door to door to encourage people to vote for George W. Bush. I have a brother who's two and a half years younger than me and a sister that's five years older than me. And one time in the front yard of our church, me and my brother almost had a fist fight over a misunderstood tweet. My parents are still together after 44 years. Growing up, my Sunday school consisted of memorizing verses without understanding where they came from and trying to believe that a man spent a good amount of time in the belly of a whale. I had my first drink when I was 24, and it didn't go well. <laughs> when I was six, I fell out of a tree in my best friend's backyard and lost most of my bottom lip, most of it. And when I was 20, I cut myself with a razor knife in my belly and had to get six staples. I dated a girl for three years that cheated on me nonstop, and I pierced my nose to commemorate my freedom from her. <laughs> my mom was diagnosed I didn't think this was going to be hard. That's why I was going to read it <laughs> with Parkinson's in 2005. And she still suffers from it. And I beat myself up for a long time thinking maybe I wasn't praying hard enough for her healing. And that's why she wasn't healed. I met the most amazing woman on the planet. <laughs> in 2010, and we had an on and off relationship for four years because I was in a traveling band <laughs> and was starting my life a little bit late. I married that best friend in 2014. In 2016, we watched our son turn blue and die in the back of the car. And that amazing woman ripped him out of his car seat and brought him back. And that's Lyle. That was before we left the parking lot of his birth hospital. We spent a month in the NICU wondering if we'd go home as a family or as two broken people. We got a diagnosis of a rare, incurable disease with a crazy name. <laughs> This disease is called maple syrup urine disease. And a year after that, we were let go from our church with no explanation and lost our entire support system. 
outside of our family who mostly lived out of state. We bought a brand new camper in 2018 and we've been living in it ever since for four years. We moved to Florida to help a friend launch a new church in New Smyrna Beach and left it because our beliefs would no longer allow us to continue working there. We came here because we found a church that we saw loving the heck out of this city. There are people in my life that think I'm someone to be followed and there's people in my life that think I'm a heretic. I'm straight, I'm white, I'm male, I'm American, I'm Florida, and I might be German. And the closest thing I've ever had to a mentor is a friend in his late 50s that I video chat with from Pennsylvania. Last year, this time, a week ago last year, I lost one of my closest friends. He had a drug problem. And he bought a Xanax off the street and it was laced with fentanyl and he died in his fiance's arms. And <laughs> when I got the call that he died, all I could think in my head was he had this coming. These verses that we read today are interesting because A lot of times we judge people and we don't know the whole story. Actually, probably every time we judge people, we don't know the whole story. When my friend Josh passed away, I had this feeling of like, yeah, of course, this is what he does, he does drugs, hard drugs. Xanax was, the, was on the lower end of what he, what he did. But it drove me nuts because he had just gotten engaged and he had just had a little girl that was six months old. And I was like, what is going on? What is this dirtbag's problem? What is his problem? Why don't you want to stay alive for your family? What is your deal? Why are you doing drugs? That's not his whole story. That's not who he is. Josh's parents split when he was little. And he wasn't taught very well how to deal with situations. His dad took off to New Jersey. His mom was an alcoholic. His friends basically raised him. The word tend is pretty important. Because for my own health, a long time ago, I kind of cut Josh out of my life. It was just too, it was too much. And I knew that he was probably going to drag me down with him and I didn't know what to do, but he had some other friends that kind of stuck it out with him and stayed close and tended to him. The verses that we read today, it's interesting. There's two parts. There's a parable Jesus tells at the end. And before that, there's some questions that it seems like he answers and he answers in a very strange way. Because we've heard the story of the blind man that Jesus sees in uh, John 9. And his disciples ask him what? Who sinned? This man or his parents? That he is in this condition. And what does Jesus say? He says, neither. It's like, this has nothing to do with the sin of someone. This is so we can watch a miracle happen. Because we have, a, we have a saying in our culture, and it's crap happens, and it's not crap, but we say it happens, and things happen, right? They're trying to find a reason for it, like, what happened? Whose fault is it? They want to know whose fault it is. Is it this man's fault that he's blind, or is it his parents' fault? And Jesus is like, can you get that out of your mind? Because you're trading in religion for superstition. And that's what happens in the beginning of the scripture today, right? Jesus is talking to some people. If you, I dare you, I ask you to go back. I challenge you to go back and read this when you go home and read the verses before it. See, Jesus is just talking about some stuff and he gets interrupted and they tell him, hey, some of the Galileans were murdered recently by Pilate while they were doing sacrifices and they mixed their blood with their sacrifices. What a big slap in the face. And of course, before they can ask, who sinned? Jesus goes, I bet you're wondering 
if these Galileans were more sinful than the rest that they died in this way. And it's confusing because what does Jesus say? He says, no. But then he says, but if you don't repent, you will die in this way. You will die likewise. It's like, wait, hang on. So no, but yes. It is a little confusing because you're like, wait, so it's not their sin that caused this, but my sin will? Because you're asking me to change. What are you asking? And then he goes into this parable about this tree, this big tree. Jesus seems to like trees a lot. He uses a lot of tree imagery. In the parable, there's a tree that's doing, is it, is it bearing good fruit? No. Is it bearing bad fruit? No, it's not bearing fruit at all. There's also a story that we all know probably pretty well from Matthew 7, where Jesus talks about trees producing good fruit, bad fruit. And if a tree produces bad fruit, it says to cut it down and throw it into the fire. Jesus is telling another story where there's a, a tree that produces no fruit at all. And the owner of the property, what does he want to do with that tree? He wants to do what Jesus has said in the past about trees that produce bad fruit, cut it down. But who says no? The gardener. Because who knows the tree? The gardener. Who knows what the tree will need? The gardener. And who's the gardener? The gardener's the one who tends to the tree. I told you all that stuff about myself just so you know a little bit more about me. And that's not the whole story. There's things I haven't told you. And if we sat down over coffee, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. You have questions, I'll answer them. I'm not afraid of that stuff. But some of us are and some of us it takes a little bit longer for us to open. And some of us have no interest in opening up some of that. But what's easy is by what we do see to judge what we think is the character of the individual. And this gardener is saying, hey, man, I know you own this, but you don't know this tree. You're seeing no fruit, but do you, do you know why there's no fruit? And then what does he say? He says, let me dig down deep. Let me find out what the issue is. Let me find out what's going on. Let me care for this tree. He could have said, okay, cool, cut it down. That was, that'd be the easy way to handle that situation. Yep, this tree sucks. Cut it down. <laughs> Get it out of here. What does he say? He says, it's a waste of soil. That's what the, the owner says. And the gardener goes, I don't think so. There's probably something else going on real deep down inside that you or I actually don't know. Will you give me a year? I know it's had three years to grow, but can you give me another, just one more year? Not just to see what it does, but to tend to it. To find out why. Not another year to observe it, but a year to get in and find out what's going on. Because he says, let me dig around the roots. And in this version, it says, let me put some manure on it. Because sometimes that's what you're going to find when you dig deep. You're going to find some crap, right? And then sometimes you have to give it some crap, right? <laughs> this is how we find out who one another is. I could look across this place and all of us do it all the time. We do it in the grocery store. We do it at the gas station when the, when the lady comes up and asks, hey, do you have a cigarette? Like everybody, we know. We judge people when we drive by them and they hold their sign that says homeless, help. I do it. You do it. We all do it. We judge immediately. What if you said, guess what? For the rest of my life, I'm not going to do that. I might not have time to stop and tend to every single thing. But if I don't have time to tend, I won't also then make time to judge. Let me dig down deep around the roots and find out. And then my favorite part is at the very end, he says, if after a year it produces no fruit, or no, he says, if it does, awesome. If it doesn't, you cut it down. Because the gardener, the one who tends, the one who's going to get in there and find out, isn't giving up on that tree. I don't know if Jesus is putting is himself the gardener in this or if it's God himself, but he's trying to say, don't give up on something you don't understand. Don't do it. 
And this is not me calling anyone out for doing that. This is me saying, don't you wish someone would do that with you too? I know what I look like, guys. I know I have these crazy earrings. I know I have a nose ring. I know what I sound like when I speak up here. I know I'm not the coolest, the smartest, the best speaking. I understand. But I tell you a little bit about myself because I'm like, man, if you don't know who I am, you don't know where I come from, you won't understand why I talk the way I talk and look the way I look and act the way I act. Everything you are is a result of everything that's happened that you're reacting to in your life. Everything. And then some of us can say like, yeah, well, yes, but I, I'm reacting poorly. Yes, because you probably weren't tended to to be taught well how to react. And I bet if you sat down with somebody and let them dig around a little bit, or maybe if you sat down with someone and dug around a little bit, you might find out very quickly that, oh, it's not the sin of this person or their parents. And no, no, they're not worse than somebody else. When they come to tell Jesus that some Galileans had died and were murdered by Pilate and had their blood mixed with their sacrifices, that's hardcore. The Bible's pretty hardcore. Most of what's going on in this book ain't fake. This happened. They were living in a very oppressed time. They were a kingdom living under another kingdom. And that kingdom that they were living under did not like their practices. Jesus and the two thieves weren't the only people crucified on a cross. Thousands of people were crucified on crosses. This is what Rome did to bring peace. They brought peace by sword. That's not peace. We don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. But this is the context of the people. So Jesus is literally, imagine right now, I'm not saying I'm Jesus, I'm just saying I'm talking, <laughs> that I'm up here speaking and someone runs in and goes, hey, Brandon, Someone just killed all the Christians across the street in that church right there. First and SB, a family church, a church that we probably don't disagree with or don't agree with probably theologically very well. And I think our minds go before our hearts sometimes and we go, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. We know how they feel toward a lot of the people in this room. It was probably their sin that got them, right? We do this with individuals. We do this with churches. We do this with denominations. We do this with states. We do this with countries. We don't always immediately go to empathy. We go to judgment. Jesus is approached and told what has happened to some men and some women who died. And then he goes, do you think that they died like that because of their sin? No. And then what about the 18 people that had the tower fall on them or were crushed? Do you think that they were worse sinners than others? No. But then he says, but if you don't repent, you will die likewise. What does he mean? Does he mean that you're going to get crushed by a tower or that your blood will be mixed with your sacrifices? No. That doesn't make any sense because he just said that's not why they died. Who sinned that this happened? No, that's not what's going on. But how did they die? They died judged. Imagine even in your own death, you died judged. Because Jesus apparently is a mind reader. And before anyone can say anything, he goes, I bet you think that they died because their sin is worse than the others around them. That's not what's happening. We live in an oppressed society, friends. This is what he's saying. And stuff happens all the time. And if you're leaning on superstition rather than me, you're going to judge those around you. And if you also don't want to die judged, repent. And we know, we know what repent means. Repent doesn't mean come to the front, weep, and say you're sorry for your sins. It means to change the way you think. And so what is he saying? He says, no, it's not their sin. Change the way you're thinking about this. Come at this from a better angle instead of thinking like hmm, i wonder if they deserved it weep mourn wonder be curious and then he tells the parable because he's saying from now on 
Instead of leaning on judgment because you don't know, no. Try to find out. Learn. Jesus is with a ragtag group of 12 crazy men that do not fit. These men left for their jobs. We have Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot in one group. Zealots killed tax collectors. <laughs> and these two are in a group together. Jesus pooled everyone he thought wouldn't make any sense together. And what did they have to do? They spent three years together doing what? Tending, learning, focusing, empathizing. I bet they fought all the time, especially with Peter. Peter's wild. Peter's the guy who cuts off people's ears. He's crazy. Do you think he's just crazy? Or do you think maybe we need to understand how he was tended to? And then also tend to. It's a hard read, the words of Jesus. And I, I think it's a lot easier for us to, not to walk in judgment. I don't think that we walk around going dumb, stupid, cool, awful. I don't think we could quite do that. But man, I'm really bad when someone cuts me off. <laughs> Natalie and I have actually... Uh, We've started to do this thing, and she's, she's, I'm glad I, I said it because she's called me out on it a couple times. I don't have road rage. There's another softer word. I'm not sure what it is. But I don't get, I get pretty mad when people do dumb things on the highway, and I, it's probably me also. But when someone isn't driving good or they do something silly or dumb on the interstate or anywhere, my phrase is this. I bet they're really good at something else. <laughs> because it's true. Do you want someone to, your life is going to be a story told by someone. Is the most important thing going to be the things that you did that made you not look so good? Or what if you die in a crazy way? What if, here, here's the thing. I spent a lot of time after my mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's, praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. My family prayed, healing God, healing, 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 and it didn't come. And my mom still to this day, I hope she never sees this. My mom still to this day wonders why God cursed her. She wants to know if she did something or if her parents did something. It doesn't make sense to her. I tried to lead a good life and she doesn't understand that crap happens and our response is more important than what happens to us. You can walk out the door today, trip and break your nose. It's just crap happens. We live in a physical world where things happen all the time. If I can't get the zipper up on my pants, I'm not like, why does God hate me? Crap happens. This message actually is probably more for me than anyone else. I get really upset about the small things, and I wonder why things aren't going my way. Me and Lyle went camping this past weekend, or this weekend. Got back yesterday. Um, I'm going to tell on myself a little bit. Friday was awesome. We went out on the kayak and paddled across and went fishing, which means not catching. With my brother and my brother-in-law and their two boys that are just about a year older than Lyle. Beautiful day. Just amazing. Went back. The sun went down. We went to our tents and all of a sudden we hear, oh. and I was like, dude, are you for real? Storm coming. Not that big of a deal to me. I'll storm chase. I am not afraid of storms. Ever since I've seen the movie Twister, you either go, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of tornadoes. You're like, I'm going to chase some tornadoes. And I want to chase them. My wife is horrified of bad weather. And now so is my son. <laughs> we were in and out of the tent, into the truck, back and forth all night until like 1130 until we laid down, the rain had stopped, and looked at the radar, and it seemed okay, and then, boom, thunder came back, 
Lyle's crying. His formula's outside of the outside of the tent because can't really have it in there. It's got to be in a cooler. And I have all of his tube stuff because I don't know if you know he has a G tube. We have to do certain things to feed that way. And I lost my mind. I grabbed my flashlight, threw it at the cooler, started screaming. You don't want to know the things I said. I was so mad because we had just. I wanted it to be perfect, and in my head, I was like, "Why is this happening? Is it something I did, God? Like, why can't we just have?" one good day oh my gosh like losing it i had i just lost it i had a bad temper straight up and i just i started laughing when i got home because i was like oh man dang it that's gonna go into the sermon i messed up so and i just was wondering i was like sure yeah <laughs> which you said you tended the shirt i was like i think you mended the shirt i'm just kidding. <laughs> But I lost it. And I think if you'd seen a snapshot of me in that moment and no other moment, you'd have been like, that guy sucks. He is a bad dad. He's a horrible man. He's cussing. He's throwing stuff. But in the scheme of things, you knew what was going on. And I'm not saying I reacted well. But my whole attitude was like, keep my son safe. Keep my son safe. Keep my son safe. Keep my son safe. And when I felt in a moment where I was like, maybe I can't, I freaked out because we went home. We drove home, we got home at midnight, and we went back the next day. But if all you ever are, and all you ever, we ever let anyone else be is their worst moment, we're not taking the time to tend to one another. This is a beautiful group of people who deserve attention and deserve to be tended. Yeah, you do. You deserve for people to care about you. And guess what? The people around you also deserve for you to care about them. We don't all come from the same place. Literally, none of you are from Florida. We don't all come from the same place. Some of us have seen some garbage in our past. Some of us are still living through some garbage. Some of us know more garbage might be coming. And the way that we react is it's not just who we are, but it's, it's how we're acting toward the things that have happened to us. I get, I get a little bit of garbage from people sometimes for being super sarcastic, which you might not know that part about me yet. You'll learn, and I'm sorry very sarcastic and very snarky and I get I'm a little bitey sometimes I turn it on when I'm here so just so you know I have to cover it up because I think I've told you before when I was in school I got picked on a lot and I put that person on I was like you know what after high school I'm sick of being treated like garbage by people being made fun of for things so I put on this mean guy suit and before anyone could come at me about anything, I, would, I could tear them down. And to a lot of people, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people about, with that. But it's me. I'm defending myself. It's not just who I am. It's what I've had to do to protect myself. And I think if you sat down and learned a little bit about me, you'd see that I'm super soft and tender. And I'll cry at the drop of a hat. I cry at Disney movies that aren't sad. We've seen The Incredibles, just can't handle it. There's a movie called The Proposal, not sad, weeping. In the theater by myself, weeping. That doesn't make any sense. But to protect myself, I've put on this person, but you would never know if you don't tend to me, if you don't tend to someone else. Some of us have this really hard exterior, but inside is a soft yoke. Actually, I think that's probably all of us. Look around the room for a second. Look, actually look. Sorry, I know I make you do things. I'm sorry. Look at each other. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. And you deserve to be tended to. And those around you deserve to be tended to also. I think that's an exciting challenge. Jesus isn't looking at these people going, dummies, why don't you take care of each other? He's like, take care of each other. That's why after this, he goes into the parable. 
about that tree that isn't bearing fruit. I saw um, when we were doing the, what is it called? Not the, the, the thing over here with the, oh my gosh. Uh, no. <laughs> the strategic, strategic planning. planning. A lot of people wrote, same people do everything. Same, it, I've heard this number a couple of times, and I'm not sure it's true that someone, I don't know if it's just like the number being thrown around. It's like the same 12 people do everything. Same 12 people. That's so interesting that we're using the number 12, but do everything. And here's the thing, those that are doing those things, let me encourage you, when you look around and you think someone's not doing something, you think you see a tree that's not bearing fruit, you can write them off if you want to, but I challenge you to go tend to them. A lot of us have never been tended to. And Jesus' challenge to tend to one another should be joyous. Because you're not going to learn more about someone and hate them more. You're going to learn more about something and someone about what went on in their life that brought them to this place, why they drink as much as they drink, why they yell and scream, why they look mad, why they're grumpy, why they run, why they don't talk to people. And you're going to see the soft center and understand as hard as any of us are, and I can be a pretty hard dude, soft on the inside, man. Because someone has in the past taken the time to dig around in the roots, find out. Instead of paying attention to up here where I'm not bearing any fruit, find out why. And I learned quickly that one of the reasons why someone went, oh, you were never discipled, were you? Oh, oh, you're still dealing with that. Is that why there's no fruit? Yeah, I think so. Oh, let's dig around. Oh, they really hurt you in the third grade, didn't they? Mm -hmm. You haven't forgotten about it, have you? I haven't. Oh, you're still carrying. You're still carrying the weight of what your dad said to you in middle school. I am. I am still carrying. Oh, what, what's going on? Oh, you lost a lot of people in your life, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, what's, what's going on? And all of us are going to have different roots. There's going to be different reasons our tree bears fruit, bears bad fruit, or bears no fruit. The fruit's not the issue, the roots are. Find out what's going on, not just in your own heart. You don't need to fix yourself before you learn about someone else. Sit down. Go to lunch with somebody today. Take someone to coffee this week. I don't know how many of you are retired, but let's do this. Let's, let's go get coffee midday, sit down somewhere, learn about each other. Start with email if you can't do it in person yet. Let's learn about one another. Let's tend to one another. You know what? Our pastor's leaving. And I've grown up in church and I've had a lot of pastors. And this is not to puff you up. But she's the best pastor I've ever had. And you want to know why? Because she sits me down in her office and she tends. She tends. And she is going to leave. And I hope that her tending to us taught us well enough that in her absence, we tend to one another. Not in this like last ditch effort to make sure we stay together, but because we actually care about one another and that's been her theme for these past few weeks is care you can't care if you don't tend heavenly father you have a big ask for us but you only call us to things that actually bring fruit and joy We've been gardened well by an amazing woman. And I ask that the tending she's done to this group, this congregation, this church, teaches us to tend to one another because it's going to get a little bit hard and we're going to want to fly off the handle. But if we can look at each other's eyes and not just hear the words that we say, 
Lord, I know that you will carry us through. We ask you to be that mother hen that we can hide under your wing. And we ask that we become good gardeners, not just to ourselves and not just to the people that we know and like already, but maybe to the ones that we have the most beef with. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
Yes, yes, yes. This is that time in worship where we share our sightings of the Holy Spirit, our joys and our concerns. I would lift up as a joy that we have Betty and her family with us. She's very recently been in the hospital and home with hospice, but very much a loving part of our church and present in worship in a way that is a joy. Thank you. And I lift up that uh, Karen Austin is even now in the hospital. They determined that she had some sort of a mini stroke, but they don't know if it was like a couple days ago or years ago. Uh, so she's there for a while figuring out the treatment, uh, but she's strong. I'll see her after church. I'll convey your love and uh, we'll keep praying for Karen. Are there others we should lift up this morning? Uh, I'm going to Excuse me, I'm interrupting you and that's terrible, but I want people in Zoom to hear you yourself. So come on up. Thank you. That's way better. I never will say it as well as you. you know, my, my son, Michael, spent 11 years of his 43 years he's lived in prison for doing things that were against the law. He's very involved with God now in his church. And he belongs to a Christian uh, motorcycle club where they call him preacher because he is, he's got what other people want. And he sent me a picture of his new t-shirt and it says, all my role models went to prison. Jesus, Paul, Joseph, Daniel, Peter, and John. <laughs> and I just thought this was a really, really cool thing. Amen. Clearly we agree. Amen. And what a perfect illustration for our sermon this morning. Thank you. It does. Uh, Pat, can you come up? I'm just going to start asking you to do this because people on Zoom can't hear. So if you had something you wanted to say after this and you came closer, I know you do, but you got something important to say. So you go. Uh, Prayers for my friend Tracy, um, our neighbor's daughter. Um, they're down from Montana every winter, and they were getting ready to go back in a couple of weeks. So ever since she's been here, she thought she's had uh, sciatic, but it turned out it's not sciatic. It's uh, a cancer, and she's waiting for a PET scan now so they can start treatment, and they'll probably do it here before they go back to Montana. So prayers for Tracy. Thank you. I'm going to call us all to join our, oh, I forgot before we start praying, uh, two more things. Uh, can you sprint up here? And while you're sprinting up, I will say it's a special joy that Kay brought her son Thomas this morning. He's right there. Grandson. So yeah, you look so young. There you go. There you go. And you know you get extra credit for bringing handsome man. So good job. Oops. Sorry, I just turned it off. You go. Hello, this way. My my sprinting days are uh, numbered. <laughs> um, I have a sister. That shouldn't shock you. Um, she lives a couple of hundred miles south of here in Boynton Beach and she uh, suffers and has been suffering for some time from uh, emphysema and uh, that's a uh, disease that it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse and then it ends uh, and she is 
trying to get a new treatment plan in which they insert valves called Zephyr valves into certain areas in her lungs because these valves release air that's trapped in those lung, in those areas. And therefore that part of her lung is no good for breathing because you have to have air in and out and in and out. And it doesn't exhale like it should. Um, and she's been having tests for uh, a couple of weeks that she was supposed to have an answer. This is a test to see if she qualifies for it. Um, she doesn't have that answer yet. She's got more tests to take this week. She's hoping to get an answer uh, uh, this week, the end of this week. And uh, if, if, if they will, if, if she qualifies, she's, she's going to do this. Um, the, the statistics are that it increases your ability to breathe and also your remaining lifespan. So we're hoping for prayers for my sister, Karen, um, and this endeavor because uh, without it, I, I don't know how long she'll be. She'll be with us. So that's my concern. Thank, Thank you. you. So we will absolutely pray about the outcome of those tests and tend your sister with prayers as you tend her so faithfully with your love. Let's join our hearts in the spirit of love and prayer. Holy One, you do call us to care. And through the gentle, persistent ways you care for us, we are empowered to do that. We thank you for the grace that helps us give our resources in ways that make a difference. Please keep blessing the giving, blessing the receiving, and helping us tend one another gently. In your own most precious name we pray, Christ. Amen.